Hello everyone. This time around, I want to talk about effective email communication. Now, why this topic comes up is, well, simply put, I deal with people by email every day, or pretty much every day. And as a result, I see examples of the more egregious things people do when emailing. And as a result, I can talk about what they do and why it doesn't work. Now, let's be clear. I'm almost certainly guilty of these things on occasion myself. So it's, uh, it's not me just saying, hey, I've got some sort of moral high ground. No, I'm not claiming that at all. What I am saying is that these things I'm going to talk about certainly impair your email communication if you do them. Okay, the first thing that definitely impairs communication and it should be obvious to anyone who thinks about it for five microseconds, is not answering everything in a message. So, to put this in perspective, say you sign up for some service from a company. I won't say what the service is, but to get the service set up, the company needs some answers to, to a number of questions. And that's perfectly reasonable. They may, may need to know where the service has to happen. They may need to know what name it goes under. A whole bunch of things like that. They, there's just stuff they may need to know before they can set it up. Now, say you're making these arrangements over email, which is not unheard of these days. Okay, so you get the arrangements underway, and then the company comes back and asks you with an email saying they need certain information. They list the information they need. Then you go ahead and reply with a quarter of the information they need. That is an example of this particular situation. They are not asking for the information for their own amusement or health. They're asking for the information because they need it to provide the service you've contracted for. We'll give them the benefit of the doubt here because sometimes they ask for more information than, than they are even allowed to have, like credit checks asking for social insurance numbers. That's not actually allowed. So there you go. But anyway, the... The company's asking you information so they can provide the service to you. Now, if you do not provide the information that they require, they cannot provide the service to you. This is the situation. So if you respond with answers to two out of five questions, there's a pretty good chance that they're going to have to come back and ask you those other three questions again. And then you're going to get this, this uh, notion that it's bad customer service and you should go deal with somebody else. When in fact, it's not them who's giving you bad customer service. It's you being a bad customer. And before you get all indignant about how the customer is always right, no, the customer is not always right. That's patently ridiculous and any Anyone who thinks about it for 10 seconds can come up with a counterexample where the customer is clearly wrong. Okay, so don't use the customer's always right to excuse this crap. And that's what it is. So anyway, you have your answer, you answer two out of five questions. Well, now the company has to come back and get the additional prod you for the additional information. Now, it doesn't matter why you didn't answer those other three questions. If you didn't, just didn't see them, that's your fault. You're an idiot. You didn't read. Uh, if you can't answer them, then you should have at least answered them with some information about that you can't answer them for some reason. Uh, so that at least the company knows you're not ignoring them at least. Or maybe you need a query about why they need to know something. Okay, that's fine. But say so. Don't just 
leave the questions unanswered. That doesn't give them any information to act on. This goes the other way as well. Uh, you know, if, if uh, you answer all five of their questions and then they come back and ask for the answer to question number five again and they quote the entire message with your answer in it, then they're the ones that are the idiots, right? Because they didn't read your response. They didn't look for the response to all of the questions they asked you. So it can go either way. But the thing to remember here is always read the entire message you get. Read it. Don't read the first sentence of a paragraph and assume what it says. Don't read the first sentence of the email and assume the entire message. That will get you in trouble. And it will make you look like the idiot not the person you're communicating with, no matter how much you think they look like an idiot because you didn't read their message. It's you that looks like the idiot. So don't do this. Make sure you read everything before you respond and make sure you respond to everything that needs a response. Everything that needs a response. Even if it's just to say that you'll respond separately or at another time or that you can't answer that you can, you're not the right person or something like that but respond to it so that's the absolute biggest thing that screws up email communication and it's simply sloppiness is what it boils down to okay the second thing that really messes with email communication is what i'm calling the scattershot effect that is, instead of sending a, sing a focused message about a single topic or uh, a set of closely related topics to a focused group of people that would need to deal with them, which would be the effective way to do this, you instead take several topics that may be tangentially related or totally unrelated, but whether they're related or not, they involve different groups of people who don't need to know what the other group is doing, potentially, but the people that have to deal with it are actually different people. So you take these tangentially related, potentially tangentially related topics that would be dealt with by different people you lump them all together in one big email with some sort of random subject line which may be related to one of the topics or none of them. Or it might be some generic useless subject. And then you send it to the union of all of the people that would have to deal with each topic. Or maybe you just pick everybody in your address book, which makes it a real scattershot. Okay, this is not effective because what it does is it brings people who don't need to be in each discussion into those discussions. And they may well end up responding to them saying, hey, why are you sending this to me and things like that. So there's a good chance you've created more work for yourself by doing that, even though it feels like more work to do two or three or four separate messages in the first place, which is what you should have done. But it's more work in the long run, and it's more brain work to keep the replies separate because now they're all going to be under that same subject heading. So why is this such a problem for effective communication? Because communication is can be effective whether it's wasting time or not for people to wade through it. Well, What's ineffective about it is it means that everybody that receives it has to read it to find the parts that are relevant to them. And that means they have to read the parts that are not relevant for them, so that wastes their time. And if you do this regularly, they have to do that for every message you send, which means they need to uh, put a lot more effort into dealing with communications from you. So what happens, because people don't want to do that, is they'll deprioritize anything you send 
and you won't get timely responses and things like that, and that will certainly impair effective communication. But the other thing it does is it defocuses your mind so now you're not clear on what's related to what anymore because you've lumped it all together in that one original email. Now it's going to be lumped together in your head. And as a result, you're more likely to conflate different things that are unrelated. And you're going to end up having chaos as a result. And it's going to look, uh, when you look at your email inbox and you get 15 replies from each of the 15 different people, you're going to have a massive stack of messages all with the same subject line. And if the replies are all on different topics, uh, you're now going to have a massive job in sorting it all out and figuring out what's going on. Now, if you don't send a lot of emails, you might not see this as a problem. But certainly, the people dealing with you, and, uh, you know, they're going to have that issue. Now, here's the, the other part. In, once you've initiated a group conversation, a lot, most people, at least, are going to re do reply all on the assumption that everybody that was included in the original message is relevant to the message or the message is relevant to them, so they will reply all, and everybody gets this explosion of emails, which they have to at least scan to determine if they're relevant to whatever that person's uh, area of responsibility is. So basically, this creates a massive time waster, and it defocuses everybody because they have to deal with all of this. So don't do that. Instead, Send each topic separately to only the people for whom it's relevant. That's basically what it comes down to. And it's a real simple thing to do. It requires maybe you take an extra minute to do two or three messages instead of one. Because you have to type up the same text each time anyway. So... Why not? Now, if it's a broadcast message, which is just intended to send out some information for people to be aware of, but they don't need to respond, then this type of scattershot communication is not necessarily a problem. But if it is the case, make sure you mention that right at the top of the message or in the subject line, preferably both. That way people can know that they don't have to take action on it and they can just read through it and file it. Okay, so there's another minor thing that people do as well and that's starting new dialogues by replying to old messages. Now, that's bad for a couple of reasons. Even if you change the subject line, it will include the reference bits in the stuff you can't see in the headers that will cause it to thread, if their email software is set to do this, to thread in with the old messages. Now, something like Gmail, for instance, will do that. And then someone will get a note that they've got uh, some new to top, some topic has a response. You open it up and you find out there's this message 15 levels down in the replies. And that's a great way to not notice a new message, depending on the specific user interface you have. But it also means that in the his if you're looking through things, scanning through things for historical information, well, you're going to have situations where the message you're looking for doesn't show because it's buried in a thread that's unrelated. And this is why starting a new conversation by replying to an old message is a really, really bad idea. It's because it includes that threading information. And then, in the future, it's hard to find that stuff. Instead, compose a new message, put the person's email in, and now you've got a new thread, and it will show up separately and that's fine. Now, on the other hand, if the reply to an old thread is actually relevant to that old thread, that's a different story. 
and in that case it may make sense. But the older the thread, the, the email that you're replying to, the less likely it is that replying to that message is the right thing to do. If you are making a request for something, you do not ever need to reply to an old message. Don't. New requests, new questions should always be new messages. Compose them new. Now this is a much smaller problem than the other two I've talked about so far, but it is a problem and it's more of a problem if you're do if you're dealing with emails in a public forum a, or in a group type forum and it's really important that you keep this in mind in those settings but if you do it all the time you won't have this problem when you get in a situation where it's really problematic okay so that's three things that impair email communication and you can probably see that they could apply to other things as well and it's uh, it's important when you're do communicating to keep that in mind and there's other things that you should keep in mind as well I was going to talk at some length about uh, word choice and composition but I realize that that's really a, a different topic altogether and it's much more general and it's probably been done to death elsewhere too of course this one probably has too basically it boils down make sure you're paying attention to what you're reading paying attention to what you're writing don't mix groups of people in conversations and don't mix conversations. That's really what it boils down to. It's really simple. If you do this, it'll be easier to keep what's keep straight what's going on and you probably feel a little less scattered. And it will help other people figure out what's going on as well. Anyway, that's enough rambling about email communication for now. If you want to be notified of future videos, make sure to subscribe. And if you've watched this far, thanks for watching.